Okay, well, um, I'm going to need your prayers today and your patience um, as I try to pull all this together in my mind <laughs> of everything that's um, in my heart of where to take us. And so um, we have been, uh, for our guests, going through Luke, the gospel according to Luke, uh, over the last several weeks now, and we, have fi we made it to chapter four of Luke's gospel, and um, the part that we found ourselves at last where is where Jesus, Luke where it records Jesus going into uh, the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And while he's there, he opens up uh, the scroll. The Jews would read from what we know now as the Old Testament scriptures. They didn't see it that way. They just had the writings um, of the prophets and Moses, what we now in our day call the Old Testament. But he unrolled it and he read from it. And as he read from it, he read a very familiar passage to uh, what would have been very familiar to those Jews about the promise of the Messiah that was to come. And his, what he read was that um, this Messiah would uh, be the one to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And for a Jew that was hearing that, especially a Jew in the first century, that at that time their people were, uh, had been uh, under the rule of the Roman Empire. At that point, the known world was really controlled in large measure by the Roman Empire. And so uh, the Jewish uh, ethnicity, the Jewish people were um, under that oppressive regime at that time. And so for those Jews who would be hearing those promises that were prophesied years and years before, would have heard that and in their mind they would have immediately thought that what those things were being declared was going to mean for their immediate context that they would be taken away from oppressive rule and that they would be liberated and that they would be uh, set back to their rightful place as the people of God, as they saw it. And what actually ended up happening in that instance where Jesus is there and he's unfolding this is he actually tells them that that scripture that prophecy was being fulfilled right there in that moment. But it wasn't being fulfilled according to the way that they had thought that it was going to be fulfilled. He was telling them that all those things about the Messiah coming and setting the captive free and healing the brokenhearted and uh, preaching good news to the poor, all of that is, is about to, is, is being right now in this moment fulfilled. And they got excited about that until they found out that it wasn't being fulfilled the way that they thought it was being fulfilled. And one of the ways in that particular passage there that the Lord let them know that it wasn't going to be fulfilled in the way that they thought it was going to be fulfilled was because he began to tell the story about examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles, non-Jews, who had been shown the mercy and the grace of God. And to a... Jew of any generation, but especially then during the first century, to have said that would have been highly offensive. What, it, what do you mean that God is showing mercy and grace and compassion to people who are not like us? That's what was going on in the, the Jews' mind. 
And what became very clear was they had lost sight of, which we'll get to here in just a second, of what being a Jew was all about and why the nation of Israel had even been established to begin with. And so what we have been talking about the last couple of weeks is the offense of the all-inclusive gospel. And we looked at why the Jews were offended, some of which we've just talked about just now. They thought that they were the people of God. We are the children of Abraham. We're the chosen ones. We've got the law. We've got the prophets. We are the rightful people of God. Not anybody else outside of us. And so in their mind, that's why they were offended. Because God is broadening out this, this message of the gospel. But then we look at the fact that before us Gentiles, which is everybody in this room, I'm pretty sure, before we get high on our horse and, and begin to think that we're somebody, we looked a little closer there at one of the examples that Jesus gave of a Gentile who was shown mercy, which, which was this soldier by the name of Naaman, and we looked a little bit closer at his story, and we found out Naaman was just as arrogant and proud as the Jews were. <laughs> He was no better. He, he had his preconceived notions about what salvation and grace and mercy should look like as well. And so before the Gentiles could begin to put our thumbs in our suspenders and, and think that somehow we got what the Jews missed, the Lord brought that story out, I believe, to help us to understand that whether Jew or Gentile, our issue is all the same. And you know what that issue is? <laughs> that issue is sin. It manifests itself in a lot of different ways. But that issue is sin. And so we're going to be in a lot of different places here in Scripture. So just keep your thumb ready there. But where we want to start it is in Romans chapter 3 and beginning at verse 9 and then I'm going to read down Lord willing to verse 30 there and so here at this point in Romans Paul has masterfully in Romans 1 talked about the lostness of the Gentiles and he's talked about the lostness of the Jews and then he gets to this place here in Romans 3 after he's just got through showing and proving that the Jews aren't any better than the, uh, the Gentiles. He says beginning at verse 9 he says what then are we Jews any better off? Paul himself was a Jew. He says, no, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, how many are righteous? None, right? None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Paul writes, no one does good. No, not even one. He goes on to say this. Their throat is an open grave. This is talking about everybody. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So what Paul is saying there is that 
no, nobody can do enough or work enough to be able to come righteous and so the purpose of the law was never intended to try to make us righteous and give us a path to get to God but the purpose of the law was to show us we're bad that's the reason why we got the law was to show us that we're sinful let's go further but now, this right here, you know, there are some circles or whatever where, you know, you have the extreme charismatics and people running around the building and this, that, and the other. You know what? This is a reason right here to run around the building, what I'm about to read. So now it says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. That's good news, beloved. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is what? No. There's no distinction. And why? Because all have sinned, it says there, and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody does. And so even though all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in that same manner, verse 24, all are justified by his grace as a gift, those who put their faith in him, through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, which just means a uh, uh, um, substitute, an acceptable one, by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. And so God was just forbearing, but he always intended for those who put their faith in him prior to Christ's coming, he saw forward to this day. And so it was never that God was just winking at sin. He knew that a day was coming where his son was going to come and shed his precious blood on that cross. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, Paul says, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through what? Faith. Through faith. Same thing. Same thing that makes, washes away a Jew's sin and atones for a Jew's Rebellion and disobedience before God. Same thing that takes that away and that sting away from them is the same thing that takes away that sting for a Gentile. And what is that? Faith in Christ. Looking to Christ. Trusting in Christ. Trusting in what he's done. Trusting in his perfect life. Trusting in his perfect death. Trusting in that precious blood that ran down. Trusting in the fact that he rose again from the dead. And looking forward to the day when he's coming back again. Same for everybody. And so, beloved, the gospel is a salvation issue, first and foremost, because Christ became as a result of our sin. That's what we've looked at these past two weeks, both from the Jew standpoint and the Gentile standpoint. And that's why it's offensive, because both the, neither the Jew or the Gentile want to hear the stuff Paul was talking about. Neither a Jew or a Gentile wants to hear, I'm not righteous. A Jew or a Gentile doesn't want to hear that my throat is an open grave. I mean, you, you give me one human being that wants to be told that I don't do anything good. Who wants to be told that all you do is sin? That even the righteous, most godly, from the external standpoint, deed that you do outside of Christ is a filthy rag. And it's really a more vile term for that in the original, but I'll spare us. Who wants to be told that? Nobody does, regardless of what background you come from. But that's the case that we all find ourselves in. We're all sinners, Jew or Gentile. And so the gospel is first and foremost a salvation issue. That's what we've looked at the past couple of weeks, kind of in depth. But here's what I want to do with God's help today, is I want to broaden this out even a little bit more and say that the gospel is a humanity.
issue. And so Christ didn't just come for sin, but Christ came for the sin of all mankind. It, it was mankind that sinned and rebelled against God. And so, why do you say that and why do you make much of that? Well, because in the day that we live in now, there's been this, and I don't have time to unpack it as I'd like to, um, but there's been this construct, this social construct in our culture, and you have to follow me with this, of, of what is called racism and how individuals from different ethnicities have been divided into what is called races. I want to show us right from the word of God, God never created races of people. He only created one race. Just one. Now there are races of other kinds like animals. <laughs> there's, the an there's the fishes. There's that race. All this is in 1 Corinthians 15 there. If you want to go back and fact check. But there's just one human race. One humanity. That's it. And from all the ethnicities have come this one humanity. And so we're going to look at a couple of places there. Let's go to Acts 14 first. Acts 14, beginning at verse 15. Acts 14, 15 and 16. And so here Paul and Barnabas, both who are Jews, are off doing Gentile ministry, so they're preaching and teaching amongst non-Jewish non people. And they go to this place there in Lystra, and they're preaching the gospel, and they're doing just some amazing things, and so all, all of a sudden people start worshiping them. That's always a danger whenever you start making waves. People want to make you a god. And so they have to push back against that, and they have to say, no, guys, don't do that. And then they, they say this, Verse 15, men, why are you doing these things? Namely, why are you trying to worship us and, and praise us? And you know what they say? They say, we are also men. We're also men of like nature with you. Just like you're a man and you got to put on your leg pants one, one leg at a time. We're the same way. Yeah, God might be doing some things through us and, and, and working through our voice and working through our mind and our knowledge of the scriptures to bring some blessing to you. But you know what? I got to put my pants legs one at a time just like you do. I got to brush my teeth and comb my hair and take a shower just like you do. We're, we're men of like nature. Don't, don't be doing that. But I mean, listen to what he's saying. They're, they're, they're humans. We're man. We're part of mankind. He goes further to say, we just bring good news to you that you should turn from these vain things to living to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And then he says this in verse 16, in past generations, he did what? He allowed all the nations to walk in their ways. All the various nations that are out there. One type of humanity made up of many nations. One human race, many different ethnicities, many different shades of that one race. Are you following me so far? Flip right over there to Acts 17, just a few places next door. We see the same thing brought out a little further, beginning at verse 22 there. Here Paul, again, is in the midst of a pagan land, and he's ministering now to the Athenians. And so it says there in verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also on the altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. 
He says, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Just a sidebar right there. All of us in here who are Christians, that's a great evangelistic strategy right there. Whatever somebody's worshiping, let's start right there and meet them right where they're at. But let's try to point them and take them to the true God. Amen. That's what Paul is doing there. He said, I, I see you worship an unknown God, but I can tell you there is a God who can be known. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all what? Mankind. All mankind, life and breath and everything. One God gives breath and life to all mankind and everything that we need. And then ver there verse 26. And he made from what? What does that say? He made from one man Every nation. Every nation of mankind to live on. Not, not 20 different men and 20 different races that produce 20 different nations. The scripture says from one man, he made all of us. How does that work? I don't know how it works, but God did it. Amen. Amen. He made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And the good news is he's actually not far from each one of us, Paul says. So, you have humanity, Adam and Eve there in the garden. God puts them together. They start procreating and having kids who have more kids and this thing starts going and all of a sudden mankind goes crazy. The Lord's like, uh, uh I'm not having it. He does away with the earth as we know it. But from Noah and his posterity there, his sons and their wives, he begins to recreate this thing all over again and they get the same commission as our original parents got and that is to uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and, and subdue it and populate and all of that and so they begin to start doing that and then as they're going along God breaks out from heaven into time and space and he calls a man named Abraham who was a pagan by the way Abraham wasn't born a Jew I mean you know that right he was made a Jew. He wasn't born a Jew. And so here's this pagan out there doing whatever he's doing, worshiping whatever unknown gods he might have been worshiping. And who knows, maybe he was a godly man in some kind of way. But anyway, God calls him and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a nation and you're going to be great. And your nation that I'm going to make out of you is going to be a blessing to the world. And that nation is what we know of as the Jewish nation. And so the whole point of it from the very beginning was that this nation of the Jews was picked out of humanity as this particular, particular ethnic group that God wanted to work through to be a blessing to the world, to every ethnicity, and to be a light to them, and to show them what it looks like to worship God, and to serve God, and to trust God, and to obey God. But what was the problem with that? They failed miserably, time after time after time after time. He would give them a chance, they, they'd get on their act for a little bit, and then bam, right back to worshiping idols, right back to having the pagans. Rather than them influencing the pagans towards the one true God, they allowed the pagans to drag them away. And now they, instead of worshiping the one true God who had brought them out of Egypt and who had parted the Red Sea and who had done all these miraculous things, rather than them continuing to worship him and to praise him and to honor them as they should, they begin to go after all these foreign wives and foreign gods. And there wasn't anything racially charged in that. It was they were being unrighteous. They were forsaking the, the, the right paths that God had laid down and start breaking rank. And so God says, you know what? You were supposed to be faithful to this covenant that I made with you. 
and the, 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 the terms of the covenant, if, if you obey, there's blessing. If you disobey, there's going to be cursing. And what we see in the end is that because they as a covenant nation weren't able to keep up their end of the, the bargain, God kept up his. But all throughout that, in the midst of all that chaos, God would make these prophetic utterances and these prophecies that one day I am going to have a people that's going to obey. One day I am going to have those who are going to love me with a pure heart. One day that's going to happen. But the blessing and the promise of that new covenant is the terms of that one is going to be. It's not going to be dependent on what they do. This next time that I'm going to do it, as Ezekiel 36 tells us, he says, I'm going to make this new covenant and I'm going to put a new heart in them and I'm going to put my spirit in them and I'm going to cause them to obey my statutes and I'm going to put my fear in them so that they won't be running after other gods. And even if they do try to do that, that fear that I put in them is going to snap them out of it and they're going to get back on the right path, serving me and honoring me and trusting me. And it has nothing to do with them and what's naturally in them. It has everything to do with what I'm going to put in them, which is my spirit. And the way that he's going to do that, beloved, the way that he's going to accomplish that new covenant is in a person. And that person's name is Jesus Christ. He's the one that we come to worship and praise. He's the one that we honor and we adore. Because here it is. God created the Israelite nation. And Israel was supposed to be faithful to him and obey him and trust him and serve him. And they failed at it. But then here comes Christ. And he's out there 40 days in the wilderness. So here it is. You have the Israelite nation 40 years in the wilderness supposing to not test God, put God to the test and break all these laws and commands that he had given them and they did and they failed. Now we have what we just looked at several weeks ago, Jesus in the wilderness 40 days, he too is being tempted as an Israelite and guess what he does? Unlike his forefathers, he obeys. He keeps the law at every place. And when there's temptation to complain and to, to grumble against God, he doesn't do it. When there's temptation to give in to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, he doesn't do it. And so he comes out on the other end of that, the one true Israelite, the only one who truly in truth kept the law and obeyed God perfectly as we're all called to do. And so now as a result of that, as a result of what Christ did, the old humanity that had failed and that had disobeyed and that had didn't do what God had called them to do, now Christ came to bring forth and to create this new humanity. And I want to show us that now in Ephesians chapter 2. So Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 11. Again, this is Paul, the Jew, writing to the Ephesians, a predominantly Gentile church. And he says this, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, Basically, to be uncircumcised was to be a unrighteous, to be a, a non-Jew outside of the covenant community. And to be circumcised was to be a part of what they considered the covenant community. By what is called the circumcision, which is made by flesh, in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a bad place to be, isn't it? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see that? See, unlike the Jews, the Gentiles didn't have the law of God. 
We, didn't, we, we were totally ignorant. We were totally out there in the darkness. We were dancing around trees and all that kind of stuff like that and worshiping sun gods. I mean, that's where the, that's where the Gentiles were. We were far off. We were way out there, separated from God, separated from the truth. But now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Here it is. That he might create in himself what? One new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. And to be sure, beloved, to be a Jew and to be near is to not be in. Just because you had the law and the prophets, you could still be lost with the law and the prophets. You were closer because you had the truth, but to be close is not in. Almost doesn't count when it comes to the kingdom of God. You're either in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom. But now Christ in his mercy has brought those who are way out there and even those who are nearby but not in. He's brought all of us in who have put our faith in him through the blood of Jesus. Verse 18, for through him we both have access, Jew and Gentile, in one spirit to the Father. One spirit. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, which were largely Jews at that point, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Do you see that, beloved? Christ has now taken from this whole mass of humanity all the different ethnicities that fit into the Gentiles and the Jewish ethnic race. All of them were they all were part of Adam's fallen race and fallen humanity and all of them were condemned. All of them were hell bound. Africans were hell bound. Germans were hell bound. Uh, uh, French were, no matter what ethnicity, they were all headed to hell. All of them were condemned right along with the Jews and the only hope was the man Christ Jesus and now he has come and he has now created a new humanity that all the nations will pour into. Do you see that beloved? And so now in Christ Christ, he's pulling from Jews and blacks and whites and Hispanics and everybody in the one new man. And that's him, the one new man. No more distinctions. I hope you see that, beloved. And so what does that mean as I try to bring this to a close? That means now, beloved, there's only two races now that are present in the world. There's the race of the old Adam and the old man, and then there's the new man, the man Christ Jesus and all who are attached to him. And so the only distinctions now are those who are alive in Christ and those who are dead in trespasses and sins of every ethnicity. Of every race. You know, the bigoted blacks and the bigoted whites are hell, hell bound together. And the saved blacks and the saved whites are glory bound together. Amen. That's the only distinctions, beloved. No other distinctions. Now, let's go further. So, now being in Christ, this is important, it changes our whole perspective on life and how we now live our lives. And so we see another place I want to take is 2 Corinthians 4. I'm trying to bring this all together for us quickly. Right there at the end of 2 Corinthians 4. This is just one place in many in the scriptures that you could go to that, that show us now that in Christ we see things totally different than what we used to. So, 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 13, Paul says this, Since we, believers, have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written 
the Old Testament folks, somebody in the Old Testament, I believe David wrote, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. And so even there, he's making this continuity of believers even in the Old Testament times and the New Testament times. We're all connected together by faith in Christ. But he says this, he says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you in his presence. For it is all for your sake that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. And so Paul is saying that. Because I know that Jesus Christ has been raised from, from the dead, it's set me free to love the world sacrificially. And so now as I'm going out and I'm loving people sacrificially, I'm doing everything that I can to see the grace. That's why Amazing Grace exists. We want to see the grace of God extend to more and more people. And, and how does that happen? As we preach the truth of the word of God, as we preach the gospel and people hear that and they're like, wow, I, I'm a sinner and I'm under the judgment and the wrath of God and Christ has come to take that away and if I latch hold of him then I'm free from that and my sin is gone and I'm brought into the family of God yes give me some of that and as we see more and more people get into that it increases and, and God is graced and, and pleased and honored and Paul is saying that is so important to me that I'm willing now to live a life that is under persecution and affliction and suffering and hardship and difficulty to see that come to pass and he goes further he says this so we do not lose heart and he says though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is what's, what's happening to the inner man it's being renewed day by day see that's what happens to people over here see people still in the old Adam when their body begins to waste away or whatever they get depressed they get sad they start trying to have lifts and, and everything to try to keep it all up but see when you're over here in the new Adam you don't care that this flesh is wasting because something on the inside of you is getting stronger day by day and you know that these things are headed to the grave anyway but one day I've got a building Paul says not made by the hands of man eternal in the heavens and so he goes further for this light momentary affliction see that's the, the mindset of people over here the people over here this is this is all they got and so everything that they that's why they don't want to suffer here in this life because all oh, it's drudgery and all of this like it's forever but people over here uh -huh, it's like it's late, you know I might have got sick yesterday but it's you know I lost my money but hey you know what it's a light momentary affliction and, and what is it it's preparing for us what an eternal verse 17 there an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we the believers look not to the things that are seen but to what kind of things? The things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, people over here, all they go by is what they see. They come in here and they're like, oh, that church isn't that big. I don't want to be a part of that. But you got people over here, they're like, wow, the Spirit of God is moving over there. That's who I want to be a part of. You see the difference there? People over here and Humanity, we don't evaluate the things the way the way we used to evaluate things is the better dressed you are, the better looking that you are, the more athletic that you are, you're somebody. Over here, that's not what you value. You can be some one-eyed woman over in New Paul, but if you pray and you want God's kingdom to come, you're my hero. Amen. You understand that? That's the people that you value when you're over in this new humanity. You don't see things the way you used to see when you're over there. And so God forbid when the people of God begin to, to act like this. When we begin to see things like the way we used to see things, that dishonors the Lord. So, my goodness. And largely what's happened in America is this right here. See, when you're over here, God has stripped away all of the staples of Adam and he's put Christ all over you. But what's happened largely is over here, you got a bunch of people who still are in Adam and they just put a Jesus banner on them. And so they're still in Adam. 
They're still dead in trespasses and sins. They're still a part of the old man, but they just put a Jesus banner on them. Uh-uh, I'm, I'm a Christian, you know. I mean, never mind that I love the things that the world loves, and I value the things that the world values, and I talk like the world talks. I have the attitudes that the world has, but I'm a Christian. I go to church every now and then. I put some money in. I participate in the Lord's Supper. Don't tell me I'm not a believer. But what we see here is all throughout the witness of Scripture, those who God makes new, they see life totally different. They relate to people totally different. We don't know people after the flesh anymore. We know people now after the Spirit. When you first meet somebody as a Christian, you're not wondering how much money do they have or, oh man, she's a white woman or she's a black woman. As a Christian, the first thing you're wondering is, does she know the Lord? Is she in Christ or is she out of Christ? That's the only thing that matters. Because if she's out of Christ, she's going one place. And if she's in Christ, she's going one place. And that's the only thing that should matter to any one of us. Not how you look, how you dress, how much do you have. Are you in Christ or why are you out of them? And we should value things the way God values things. That's one of the reasons why in Matthew 7, Jesus said, many, he didn't say a few, many on that day are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, weren't we in the meetings? Weren't we this and weren't we that? And he's going to say, I never knew who you were. Yeah, you did all the outward stuff or whatever, but you still had Adam stamped all over you. And you just had a Jesus banner on. God forbid that that would be any one of us. So one final thing, and then we're done, I promise. First Peter 2. Because what I want us to be sure of, beloved, is that just because we're now in Christ, and we see things differently doesn't change or deny the reality that there are injustices in this world. I want us to be sure of that because that's one of the arguments for people still holding on to distinctions. But what about all the injustices? What about all the wrongs? Listen, those are legitimate. And, I, and, I, and it's actually sin to deny that there are still injustices. But the difference is how we deal with those and how we perceive those. And so 1 Peter chapter 2 and here's what the Apostle Peter writes to those believers there. Beginning at verse 16. Peter says this, Live as people who are free, talking about Christians, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. He says, Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. And he says this, not only to the good and to the gentle, but what? Also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, beloved. See, that's the difference about people over here who are part of the new man. The things that they do now in their life, they do because they're mindful of God. They're not mindful of their tribe. They're not mindful of their socioeconomic status. They're mindful of God. How does God feel about what I'm doing? Is God pleased about this? Not is my social group okay with it. And let's go further. Mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also, here it is, suffered for you, leaving what? Leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. How did he walk? He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Yet when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. But what did he do? He continued entrusting himself to one or to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Do you see that? 
Nobody suffered more unjustly than Jesus Christ did. And, and I would argue even more so because you read it right there from the scripture. He had no sin. See, even, even us on our best day when we suffer unjustly, we're still not totally innocent. We're still sinners. We still, you know, that's why even when people hurt me or whatever, I have to always try to quickly remind myself, you know what, Chris? There was a time in your life you hurt some people pretty bad. Before I get all bent out of shape about, bent out of shape about somebody dogging me, all I got to do is go back in the Rolodex in my mind. It's like, mm, you know what? There was that time you really dogged somebody out. And so it really humbles you real fast. But when we think about Christ, he never did any of that. He never dogged anybody out. He never harmed anybody. He never mistreated anybody. He committed no sin. And yet he still willingly su subjected himself to unjust oppression and even murder. And why did he do it? He did it so that he might bring us to God. So that we might be set free and redeemed and restored and have a place around the table of God. And so he calls us to follow his same example. And so when we talk about no distinctions and this, that, and the other, and we talk about being now a part of the, old, the new man and leaving the old distinctions behind, that's not to say that we look at this world and ignore the reality of injustices. In fact, Christians ought to be the main ones who are oppressing to, to, to speak against those injustices. But we don't do it as the old Adam did or does. We do it now as believers. We don't fight for people just for temporal good. We fight for their eternal good. I'm not just worried about young black men, you know, getting an education or whatever and, and, and having a good life in this world. I'm worried about them being a part of the new man. I'm worried about their eternal destiny and their eternal home. You can get all the money. You can get all the education you want to and be on Wall Street and die without Christ and go hell. And go to hell. And what did I do? Oh, well, I gave them a good life in this temporal life. No. Not the new man. The old man would think like that, but not the new man. Amen. So, beloved, there's no place now for those who are in the kingdom of God, which, Lord willing, I'll talk a little bit more about next Lord's Day. There's no place in the kingdom of God for an us and them mentality. The only us and them mentality for those who are in Christ is are they saved or are they lost? Do they know God or do they know, not know God? Are they alive in Christ or are they still dead in trespasses and sins? Those are the only distinctions for the, for the Christian. The only one. Every other distinction, every other thing is secondary. Amen? Amen. Amen. And would God give us the grace and the courage to represent this in our world? If there was ever a day that Christians from every stripe needed to be called to this standard, I'm telling you, 2020 is the day. 2020 is the day. And regardless of what your stripe is, regardless of what your tribe is, rep represent the perspective of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. This stuff is passing away. America has a shelf life. We can fight and nah, make America great again all, all you want to. You know what? There's a day coming where America's going down. And every, the scripture says every kingdom is going to bow to his kingdom. We sang about it today. Every one of them. And so do you really want to attach yourself to the Titanic? No, I want to take my place with God. I want to be standing with the Lord Jesus. And I'd rather be with my Chinese brother and my Mexican brother and my white brother and my German brother and my Indian brother and holding hands with them in Christ than, than clinging to my tribe and go to hell with all the blacks or all the whites or all the Mexicans or whatever stripe you're a part of. I hope you hear that today, beloved. We're all one, one spirit. And that's a glorious picture there in Revelation. When John looked out and he said, I saw around that throne men from every nation and tribe and tongue worshiping the Lamb. And, and do you think in that picture he saw all the blacks in this corner and all the whites in this corner and all the Mexicans in that corner? Blasphemy if you tell me that. No! I think on purpose God had us all mixed in there. Just so that the world could see this is what God does by his spirit. 
And may our church be a small expression of, of that bigger picture. Maybe we close on, um, I don't know, what would be a good one to close on? Maybe this, I believe. Because we want to make that de declaration. There are certain things that we believe. We believe in God our Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the saints' communion. We believe in one holy church. We believe that all of us are going to be ruling and reigning with Christ around that throne. That's what we believe as Christians. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's stand and let's sing it. And after that, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be dismissed.